number four or number five? I was looking at the same shoes and I was like, oh, okay. Yeah, okay, yeah, number five. Um. that we're going to cover tomorrow and we will only spend one day on that um, and it's not even a whole section it's the last part of this section and that's all we'll do and then um, we'll be ready for a test probably Friday um okay, that's what everybody said um if I cross multiply on this one I multiply both sides by y and both sides by dx I get y dy equals x dx and I integrate. So I got one half y squared equals one half x squared plus c. I'm going to go ahead and solve this for, you could plug in at this point, I always solve it for y. Uh, let's plug in, I plug in, I plug in. What am I talking about? y equals two and x equals one. So one half two squared equals one half times one squared plus c. Um, 2 equals a half plus c. Oh, yeah. I see what you're saying because I disagree with that. I thought number one C is not three one half. No, yeah, I don't know. I got the same Yeah, that's what I did. That's what I did. We divided all of them. Let me plug in. Let me plug in for C and see if we come back. You should, yeah, yeah. I'll get. So now, if I multiply everything by two, I get x squared plus three. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they do, they do essentially, because if they solved it for C, they would have, if you left the C in this equation, you'd multiply both sides by 2, right? You have y squared equals oops, x squared plus 2C, because you have to multiply by 2. So you get y squared equals this, or actually y equals the square root of x squared plus C. And if you multiply your C by 2, you come up with 3, which is the same thing here. So it just depends. They said, they, they probably, did they say in the solution C equals 3? Yeah. Okay, so they just thought it's fine. It's fine. It's C, the C you get is not, can you come up with the equation like that? They're just saying once you solve it for Y, that's the C value once you solve for Y. Well, Joyce asked the same question, and I, I couldn't answer it because I was like, All right, and then you said four and five. Um, y equals x. You may do that one, too. No, I just don't understand how y equals x. Well, yeah, I did write something. Oh, four and five, all right. 
I said dy dx equals y over x when y equals 2 and x equals 0. Um, I'm going to cross multiply here, I think, first. And then I'll move everything the way it needs to be moved. But I just want a single equation. All right, I need the y's to go with the x's and the x's to go with this. Um, so what I'm going to have to do is divide both sides by y and then divide both sides by x. So what I end up with is y negative 1 dy equals x negative. Is that whatever I got? Sure. All right, so when I integrate, I end up with the natural log of y equals the natural log of x plus d. Right? I'm plugging in 2 and 2, so I got log 2 equals log 2 plus c, so that means c has to be 0. Y'all still with me? So now the problem becomes if I've got log y equals log x, how do I solve that for y? Well, if I just e both sides, That's how it works in the class. Mm -hmm. If you get rid of the L on one side and it's not L on the other side, it goes to the X. Yes, yes, yes. This is E raised to the log Y equals E raised to the log Y. Depends on that from Y equals to the Uh, no, right. Fine. Those classes are cute. <laughs> All right, number four. This is a good one. I feel like my pen was not that thick before. <laughs> All right, let's get them together. I'm going to divide by y and multiply by dx. Does that confuse anybody if I do those two steps at the same time? So I get inverse y dy equals x dx. Does everybody go with that? All right, integrate. Log of y equals um, x squared plus, what do I have here? When y equals 3, and x equals 0. So log 3 equals 0 squared plus c. So log 3 is c. So I have log y equals x squared plus log <coughs> uh, log 3. Who's number 13? You get a gold star today. Where is your phone? Well, I'm lost over the LN. The LN. Oh, that's where I found C. I didn't know how to find C. We're fixing to do that. We're fixing to do that. They, remember, they solve for Y before they find C. Did you do that too? You, like you want me to do that now? I, I can. No. Oh, you can just write LN3. They do it this way. Like, I don't know. So I'm going E, E. Now, this is another one of those kind of problems where I'm going to split it up, which is probably what they did, because the E and the log cancel each other out, and I know that, right? So I've got E to the X squared times E to the log 3. Well, what is E to the log 3? It's just 3. So I get Y equals E to the X squared times 3. Yeah, 3 E to the X squared. I didn't really know how to E. Yeah. 
always the outro. Nah, you think this is hard? And five, okay. Oh, okay, yep. I wrote down what is Okay, they had A, A equals like area. Like they had A equals three. On five? Four. Yeah, it's and just one plus. You don't have to. Three equals A to the E. Wait, A. Wait, three equals A E. Exponent zero. Exponent squared. Yeah, I was a little bit. It was. Yeah. Sometimes. Like what is A? I have no idea. All real numbers. I think they put a very maybe they held the place of something with a variable there. I think they make things so complicated sometimes when they're really just not that hard. That's my opinion. I do the way that makes sense, that is justifiable and makes sense. They'll do things that are. Yeah. All right, and number five. They, calculus loves an E and a law. All right, I'm going to do some shuffling here. Um, I am going to divide by Y plus 5 and multiply by DX. So I get Y plus 5 to negative 1. Everybody okay there? That whole quantity, DY, equals this whole quantity, You can think about a u substitution situation. So here, if I let u be y plus 5, then du is dy. So really, this is the integral of u to the negative 1 du. Which is the natural log of, it's not u, it's... <laughs> I don't have to have the absolute values here, and the reason I don't have to have the absolute values here is because in the beginning, is my domain too long? It's okay. We'll talk about that a little bit later. And now, oh, now I need to plus. I need to plug in. What did I have? One and zero. Um, zero, one, one. So I get log of five equals. 1 half plus 2, which is 5 over 2. Is that right? Oh, sorry. And x is 0. All right, so now I have log y plus 5 equals the rows. 1 half x squared plus 2x plus log. Now, how am I going to solve that? E. All right, so I got y plus 5 equals. I'm probably going to leave these two together, but then pull this one out. Is that what they did? So that's just 6. So I've got y plus 5 equals 6e to the 1 half x squared plus x, and now I just need to move the 5. This one looks fine. Appreciate your honesty. It's not, I think y'all were trying to follow those solutions. What else? Y'all said another one, four and five and something. Okay. I just want to know what you do after you find the. On six? I don't know where you are. I think I got this one.
Um, I'll make this cosine, and I'm going to write it like this so you can see it a little bit better. So I'm going to integrate. I could, but why? Oh, I don't know. I, I, that's, that's, I don't, that's too much. That's too much. I'm going to do a U sub here. Nope, I can't do U sub. Wait, I might have to. Wait, let me think about this. Yeah, the solutions do confuse you a lot of times. Where, what? So, this, you're right that this is secant squared. Do we know the antiderivative of secant squared? Yeah. We do. Yeah. I was about to do a U sub and I can't. You see why I couldn't do a U sub here? If I let U be cosine Y, what would be DU be? Right? I don't have any other trig function in there. So that's whenever I went, oh, wait, can't do that. Okay, so sometimes there's some reasoning that you have to go through to get there. All right, but I do recognize secant squared because the antiderivative of secant squared is tangent I just changed cosine yeah because this is 1 over cosine squared y. and cos 1 over cosine is secant where's Sophia oh. all right I'm gonna plug in <laughs> hi Sophia No, because if we're taking attendance, it just dawned on me while y'all were writing that. Maybe y'all might know. Um, zero and zero. So tangent of zero, here's what y'all hate. That is what I hate. That's what I hate. It's zero. What's the tangent of zero? Zero. So zero equals C. So my equation is tangent Y equals X. How do I solve that for y? Inverse tan, that's exactly right. So I got y equals the inverse tan of x and I stop. What else? Okay. Because y'all are going, this is just too much, too many words, too much stuff. All right, I got dy dx. Always read through the question very, very carefully. Sometimes there's little snippets of information that you need. Um, if you're an underliner, underline the important stuff. Whatever you need to do to get through, I tend to underline stuff. Then it tells me that the second derivative... I just searched for I just searched for derivative problems. Okay. Um let y equals f of x be a particular solution to the differential equation. dy dx equals xy cubed with f of one equals two. Now, first of all, what does that mean? X is x is one, y is two. Just like we've been doing, right? I just gave it to you a little bit different. Write an equation for the line tangent to the graph of y equals f of x at x equals 1. What in the world does that mean? You're just plugging in. So part of this is being able to interpret what it is that they give you and what it means in terms of the problem, right? So if I want a tan line, what do I need for a tangent line? A derivative because I need a slope and a point, right? I have a point. And I have a slope. All I got to do is plug in to find it. Mark, set, go. Most of the time in calculus, you'll see the equation solved for y, but not simplified or distributed or anything of the sort. We just say y equals and we go from there, but we do move that y2 over. You don't have to by any means. I always just do it. 
That's slow. Slow to the camera. So nice, right? That's part A of an FRQ from an actual old test that you could do no problem already. Yes? Easy peasy. That would probably be worth, I would say that's probably worth two points. Probably a point for the slope and a point for the equation. It's probably a two-pointer. Probably That's usually about the least they do is a two-point. Then part B, the big one is the one is the one C. That's why it's, but several of these I got a little dot by the ones that were like the, the heavy weighters. You know. Um, use the tan line equation from part A, <coughs> excuse me, to approximate f of 1.1. This is given that, what? You do or don't? That was a, I think that was what, five? Yeah, that was certain. Oh, yeah, I'm not right now. No, one point. Okay. I have an equation that estimates at that point yes understand what a tan line does that can give me a good estimate of the function without even knowing the function right there so it says use this to estimate f of 1.1 well right now i'm estimating f of x to be 8x minus 1 plus 2 so f of 1.1 would be 8 times 1.1 minus 1 plus 2 these are designed to be done without a calculator. Okay. We'll get to that in just a second. We're going to answer the first part first. <laughs> Approximate f of 1.1. Use the equation from part A. So they even told you what equation to use. Use the equation that you got in A, that easy tangent line equation, to approximate f of 1.1. Well, okay, I'm just plugging in 1.1 for x. And I get... You would get... As, no. Mm -mm, mm -mm. If you use... If you, use, if you mess up on one part and you use your incorrect answers from say part A to answer part B. If you do part B correctly, you're not going to lose those points. Oh, most of the time we don't go back to a part A or a part B to answer. This is kind of rare to do that. Usually they're independent problems. If you, yeah. Mm -hmm. If you had a point for that, yeah. And I think that's why they don't usually do that. It's very rare to see it, but you go back and use. A lot of things you can use some of your answers from, from before, but most of the time you don't need them. All right, find the, oh, no, wait, i got to finish. Given that f of x is greater than zero, what does that mean? Let's break this down. Y is positive, but what does that mean in terms of the graph? That just means I'm up here, right? I'm just above the x-axis. Let's keep that in mind. So f of x is bigger than 0. And anytime I'm between 1 and 1.1, so now I'm talking about this little area, like right here. Nope, 1 and 1.1. If this is 1, we'll say this is 1.1. I'm talking about this little area, and I've got to be I've got to be above the axis here, right? Because it said I'm positive. <clears throat> Use the approximation for f of 1.1 greater than, or is the approximation greater than or less than f of 1.1? Explain your reason. Right. Okay, so let's think about this. If my if my derivative is positive, what does that tell me about the original function? What do you mean about positive? It's increasing. It's going up, right? So I've got this, somehow this increasing function, I don't know exactly what it's doing, but it's increasing, right? Uh, 
12 is greater than 1, between 1 and 1.1 1 .1 approximation. Is that increasing? And is that increasing? Yeah. They're both still increasing, right? But what I'm trying to show you here is what what's the difference in the two? Well, they're both increasing the whole time, but what's changing about them? The, not the slope. What's it called? The second derivative, what's it called? The concavity. Remember when we talked about the concavity having to do with if your approximation was an overestimate or an underestimate? Like if I'm concave down and increasing, and this is my tan line, then I have overestimated. But if this is my tan line and I'm concave up, then I have underestimated because it's always below the graph, it's always above. So that's a good thing to write down somewhere if you have forgotten. If I am increasing and concave up, okay, so that's this, and I always have to draw it out to see it, I can never remember, but all I have to do is draw one simple little example and I'll remember. Then my tan line is an underestimate, and you will have to use this to justify it. Like, this is what we will say. Because the second derivative is bleh, the function is concave, bleh, which means this is an over or underestimate. And if I'm increasing but concave down, suddenly we see why they gave us the second derivative. Right? Or do you see why they gave us the second derivative? We got to check the kind. We know it's increasing because the first derivative is positive. So that puts us in one of these two. Now we need to know is the second derivative positive or negative at that point? What point am I looking at? Well, I'm still looking at that point, one, two. Because that's what we're because that's the point we use for the tan line. So that's where we're at this point one two, and we're using this line to estimate one point two. Right? So what I want to know is when I do that, is that gonna be an overestimate or an underestimate? And to know that I need to know the concavity. So I'm gonna come back to my problem. And I'm going to say, well, second derivative at 1, 2 is 2 cubed times 2 cubed. Because that's my tan line point. This was, I have C highlighted on here, but this was probably your heavy hitter. I'm going to say this was probably, I wish I'd run the scoring guides. I almost always run the scoring guides with them, but I had so many here. Um, I would say probably a point for your tan line on this one, and this is probably anywhere from three to four points on your understanding here. You'd probably get a point for knowing to plug into the second derivative, just for knowing to use it and getting, let's see, what is this? Hey, I don't even have to finish doing it. I could come here and say, I know that this is going to be positive, right? I don't need an exact value. That's irrelevant. I just need to know, is it positive or negative? What does that tell me about the function at that point? Concave up. So right now, I know that the function is increasing, and maybe I say f of x, maybe I say at 1, 2, f of x is increasing because dy dx is greater than 0, and concave up because the second derivative
therefore, f of 1.1 is a what? Concave up and increasing here. Yep, underestimate. I told you I have to draw. It's not that it's a bad estimate. It's just that I know anything on that line falls below the curve. So anything I get, the actual value is going to be a little bit higher. No. I can talk forever. What? No, I'm just kidding. Oh, you know that, Robert? You know that. Okay, so when we talk about underestimate or overestimate, we're talking about we have to look at increasing, decreasing, which comes from the first derivative. But we also have to look at concavity, which comes from the second derivative, because that determines, I mean, what if I was decreasing the whole time? Now, this is the flip situation. If I'm decreasing and I'm concave up, I'm an underestimate, right? Because I'm falling below. And if I'm concave down I'm and decreasing, then I'm an overestimate. So it depends on those, both of those things. Does that make sense? But how does that relate to, uh, how did we figure out this? How did we figure out this? Because we knew from, we knew from part A that the first derivative was positive. Uh -huh. That means I'm increasing. Okay, that's close. Yeah. So I'm in one of these two situations. Yeah. Then I found the second derivative at that same point and found that it was positive, which means I'm in this situation right here. So I'm an underestimate. Yes, yes. I've never seen, they don't throw frivolous information in there. All right, I want you to try part C on your own and then we'll come together. And That would get me a point right there, even if I didn't know what else to do. By the way. It's called separation of variables, knowing that you had to get the variables on the same side together, the same variables. You get a point for that every time. This also will almost always give you a point.
uh, I multiply both sides by two. <gasps> oh my gosh, Stacy. If I minus a half, that'd be right. Better. Mm -hmm. And I would leave it like that. I times everything by negative two, right? Which yeah, cut all my mm -hmm. No, now how do I get rid of the exponent? I raise both sides to the negative one half. Flip over to the next one. Roughly 15 minutes of question. But, I mean, you can, if you finish, they're not, you don't get them one question at a time. You get the four non calculator and the two calculator, um, and then you, yeah. They do it like Yes. Yes, some of them you will breathe through and others of them, that's why you should go through and answer what you know. But I always tell everybody, don't ever, ever, ever leave anything blank. If you don't know what to do, and you'll see the more we get into, because we'll start working with these FRQs and I'll give you the scoring guides and everything else. You get the randomest stuff will give you a point here or there. And it could be the difference in making a three or a four or a two and a three just by having, little. so I always tell everybody, take a derivative of something somewhere Integrate, do something, right? Something you know how to do with the equations that are given and just, I mean, it's a shot in the dark if you don't have any idea, how, but you might get a point somewhere. All right, so look at number five. Yeah. Because it said find the particular solution. So a particular solution is a, is a solution to the differential equation. That's always what that means. All right, so I want you to try at least A and B on your own for number five. Yeah, it's got to be. Okay, so it needs to be a less steep slope. And a less All right, are we okay on slope fields on how we find those for each of those points? And we're just plugging in that dy dx to find the slope. And then just kind of sketching. And you're not going to be exact about it, and they don't expect you to be exact about it. They expect the sketch there. That's why it says sketch. But you do need to show there. I always, whenever I check students, slope fields, I'm looking for the undefined, I'm looking for the zeros, and then as they start changing from positive to negative and so on, just to demonstrate that you do understand the way that is working. All right, part B. Have y'all gotten there yet or you need a minute? Did you do a U-sub? All right, find the particular solution. So somebody asked earlier, how do we know that that means 
solving the differential. Anytime you see find the particular solution, we're talking about solving, especially if I'm given a differential equation, I'm talking about a separation of variables and finding y. So here, I have dy dx equals y minus 1. And guaranteed, if you're given a differential equation to start with, at some point, you're going to have to solve. Okay. Um, I'm going to end up with y minus 1 to the negative 1 dy equals x to the negative 2 dx. Is that what you guys got when you separated the variables? Remember, this is half the battle. They, they reward you for doing that, for getting to that point of just separating them or knowing to separate them. Um, yes, here I get the natural log of y minus 1. Mm -hmm. That's right. Remember whenever we first did that? That's where it's going to come. Yeah. Um, this is going to be negative one-third. And now I am ready to plug in. Gosh. I'm messing up everywhere today. Worry about y'all's blog questions. Okay. But Robert is right. Um, if you look at your sheet, this is always an absolute value here. We tend to drop it off a lot of times when we write it, but sometimes that does come into play like here. Do I get a half for C? If I'm in an FRQ situation and I am not in a multiple choice situation, I am going to stop and leave this just like this. I am not going to risk messing up on anything. There are no rules about negative exponents, about simplifying, about any of that. I am not going to leave myself any room to mess up. I am just going to stop when I've done what they've asked me to do, which is here. I'm not doing anything else with that. Well, so that's good to do. Like on multiple choice, you'll have to do that because they will they won't have it. You know what I'm saying? But in a time situation on an FRQ, I'm leaving it, I mean, I'm not going to say as complicated as I can, but as much as I can. Robert. He was sleeping sitting straight up. You could. You certainly could. You could split them up like that. But what I'm saying is, why risk splitting them up wrong? What do you mean? Well, 
Well, you're doing E to and both, you're doing E to this whole side when you do it. So you're taking everything on that right side and making it an exponent on E. The limit as x approaches infinity of f of x. And I just found f of x. So they're talking about this, and they're talking about as I go to infinity. So here's those thinking limit questions again, right? I'm going to assume there's an asymptote somewhere on this one if I have to guess. Um, but if I put infinity in here, right, and, I, and, and let's just think about it. E Right? So this is e to the one half over. that there's a negative exponent on the infinity itself. All right. Well, let's think about it, though. What happens if, if I take, okay, that. That's a really small decimal. That's actually going to zero. So if that's going to zero, this whole bottom's going to zero. Right? So it's just one. It's going to zero, but that doesn't mean that it's zero, right? It just means it's getting closer and closer to zero. So yeah, I would say that the limit to this one is one. Yeah. So that's just going back. That would probably be a little one pointer there. Can you evaluate the limit? All right, here's what I want you 